Hello and welcome to this first interview uh, where we're trying to shed some light on how the film industry will look like when this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, is over. Today we're going to have with us Peter Weber, film director. Uh, he directed films such as The Girl with the Pearl Earring, uh, Hannibal. He's worked extensively in cinema, TV and all around the globe. Uh, so we're going to uh, hear what he's got to say about uh, this topic. Good. There we go. How can I help you? <laughs> Hello, Peter. Thank you for doing this with us. The film industry before this pandemic uh, was already undergoing major shifts. How do you think this pandemic will, will, will impact? Do you think that anything good will come out of it after this changes happen in the long term? I think if we learn some lessons from this, then yes, I think a lot of good can come out of it. People will have watched every single thing on Spotify and on Hulu and on HBO. And, and also there will have been a gap, a hiatus in production of a minimum of six months, probably more, could be longer. So the first for produced material when we come out of this is, is, is going to be enormous. So that could be a big spur because there'll be a backlog we have to catch up with because there'll be an incredible demand. I'm talking specifically for the streaming services here. In terms of exhibition, in terms of movie theatres and the rest of it, maybe people will come out of this starved for a communal experience. I think actually, to be honest, a lot of people will be a little bit paranoid about sitting in a big dark room with loads of strangers potentially breathing germs. I think it would take quite a while for you know cinemas to return to normal. You mentioned about um, how a film set would look like and how things can be can be shot right now. So how do we do it? Let's work out how, how do we do it. Because I was thinking about this the other day. So does it mean that everyone will have to have had antibody tests to see who is you know, who's immune and who's not. Does that mean only immune people will be able to work together? Do you check people's temperature with a thermometer when they come into work? Um, you can do social distancing pretty much for the crew. Yeah, pretty much. But it'd be very difficult for actors in scenes. What do you do with extras as well? When you've got hundreds of extras who turn up, you know? I mean, it's practically, it's very, very difficult. But we can obviously tell stories in different ways, in different stories. I mean, most of our social interaction these days is through this. So maybe, you know, maybe there's going to be Zoom-led dramas and Skype-led dramas, but I mean, that, see, it strikes me that that's a bit, could be a bit like soap well, opera. I don't know, maybe it might be a spur to something interesting, but something's going to happen. Because, for example, for the crew, you can have, uh, you know, masks and gloves, but for actors, you cannot really shoot them with a the mask on and, and gloves and all that protection. I mean, I agree. It would seem ridiculous. You certainly couldn't do it if, we, if you were doing a period drama. That would be ridiculous. Although it could be a plague set drama. In the modern world, this might be the modern world that we get used to. Part of the problem at the moment, I think, is that we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we're going to end up. I mean, the, you know, the people who I feel really sorry for, friends of mine, writers, who are now having to decide this... This um, film that I wrote, a contemporary film, is it now a period film? Do I now have to set this in the pre-COVID era? Because all the rules are different, you know? You can't, so maybe I, what I have to do is say this film takes place in 2019. If anything takes place in the current day, do we have to have all this paraphernalia that we're, we're talking about? Otherwise it doesn't represent the real world. If everything changes, you know, if the, our way of living has to change, then our films are going to have to, and, and our novels and all the rest of it, are going to have to reflect what, what we're actually living. So, yeah, some people are pulling their hair out, I think, at the moment, creatively. <laughs> it can be quite dramatic for a production if, for example, a lead actor gets sick. Yeah. Because this is a disease that it doesn't go away in six, seven days' time. Yeah, yeah, no, completely. It's, again, we, we don't have a crystal ball. We, we can't tell. If there's a worst-case scenario where this... Um, disease is around for a long time, there are major societal changes, then inevitably it's going to change the, the kind of cinema we make, the kind of TV we make, you know, the kind of work that we do, the kind of art we create. But something good might come out of that. Maybe it will mean the invention of new forms. Maybe it will mean the invention of different kinds of storytelling. Maybe the world that we live in is going to need different kinds of stories because it will have to, have to reflect this new reality and, you know, a, a reality of social, social distancing. So, I mean, I sometimes think when societies go through very hard times, it means that there can be incredible stories to, to tell. 
people are going to have to come up with more interesting stories than, oh, someone catches COVID, they go to hospital, you know, like pandemic cinema. But it's, but the world has changed, you know, you feel it when you go out there and you feel it in the, the looks of people's faces and stuff. So it's quite a fascinating time. It's a good time for post-production people, you know, animators, anyone who's working with that might become a much easier way to tell a story and this will become a, an era for animators. But from a business point of view, you know, of course, it's a complete disaster. No one's going to cinemas. There's no production going on to speak of. So nothing's being made, nothing can be sold. You know, I have a couple of documentaries, I have a few movie scripts on, on, the, on the go, writers I'm working with, producers I'm working with. So we will have um, Zooms or Skypes, you know, like, like I'm having with you. Um, that, that side of things, getting material ready to go, that part of the, of, of the business can, can carry on. But you, you know, you've spent your life doing it, how it's a very social event, a film festival, a very particular event because it folds in some art, some commerce, some you know business like um, you know build build building links and collaborations and stuff, and it's a very particular ecosystem. And now that has disappeared. And sure, you can have some virtual screenings, you can have a virtual festival, but you're not going to. There's no way. I mean, you know that you can just get that frit on that you get of having random people there and then, you know, so you bump into someone in the evening in a bar and then before you know it, you're discussing a film that you might make with them the next day or you get invited to a screening and then you see um, an actor whose performance you wouldn't have seen otherwise. There's, that, there's an incredible richness of life, which is why we normally end up getting to bed at four in the morning. <laughs> there's no way that a, an online, you know, it can do some things, but there's a lot that it can't do, I agree. There have been quite a few um, film and cultural, you know, relief funds that have been established mostly by government, yeah. but also by private companies as well. Talking about also to some of these, you know, some of this crew that sometimes live from paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, 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 no, completely. I mean, this is the, the thing that is a real nightmare. I mean, you see, as a, as a director, you have different kinds of rhythms, yeah? Because what you do, often you're involved with a project developing it, and then involved raising money, and then involved shooting it, and then cutting it, and then involved in some aspects of the publicity and press and distribution. There's a whole kind of narrative arc to actually getting a film together and, and, and selling it. Often directors, unless they're doing soap operas or something like that, are used to having periods of time when they're working very intensely, and periods of time when, when they're not. Crew members, if you're a grip, if you're a best boy, if you're a cameraman, if you're an assistant camera person, you know, then you, every time you work, you're shooting. You're either doing a little bit of prep or you're, or you're shooting. So you, you need shoots to be going. I know that there was a Disney production. I can't remember which one, but anyway, there was a big Disney film that came over here that put all its crew onto furlough. <clears throat> so if you're working for one of those multi-million um, dollar um, movies, I, I, you know, a lot of people in the UK do that, and we spend a lot of time servicing the be the Americans, um, then, then you'll survive. But there's an awful lot of people I know who work on smaller films or on TV shows, and they're not actually getting any support at all. It's, all right, let's be complete optimists. They're, they're, they managed to get the virus on the run. There's, a, there's a, at least some testing that happens in the meantime, and then we get a, we get a vaccine. And so in X months time, they, you know, I would have thought at that moment that there will be, you know, that every single crew person who's around will be employed. The limit there, of course, is going to be on the limit, you know, the limit in terms of actors. So places with small film industries obviously won't be able to gear up in the way that, say, the Americans will, will be able to gear up. I'm sure there'll be like a gold rush. There'll probably be some terrible things that are made as well as some, as well as some good things. But, I mean, feast and famine is not a way to run any organisation, you know. But I think any self-respecting um, film commission, film board, whatever. That's exactly, they should be pulling together as much money as possible. They can't spend it on anything else. So stick the money into development. You were talking about film development being one of the few things that, that, that can be done. At I moment. have heard of one shoot that is happening this weekend because a friend of mine is first AD on it. And he told me that they're doing a virtual shoot. Now, I don't know how they're doing that. Uh, he said they're doing it on Zoom. I mean, I was, I was saying, well, what are you doing? Is there a director and DP and you've got a drone or something? I know some people are shooting bits of documentaries, you know, but I would imagine that that's probably about it. I'd like to talk now about the format. It's obvious that the streaming services are gaining a lot of traction during this pandemic. And even before the pandemic, there was a major shift for, you know, TV series, 
series productions, uh, mini series. Do you think that now that's going to be even more significant, the shift for mini series, TV series, instead of the typical 90, 120 minutes feature film? Why, why would the format change? I mean, well, you know, what it, people have already discovered streaming, they've already discovered you know, the fact that you can binge box sets, this just gives them more of an opportunity to, to do it. The only way it will change the format is if we are unable to go out and shoot again. If we can't do things the way that we used to do, then we are going to have to invent some formats to create um, new stories, you know, stories that reflect this kind of socially fragmented reality. Now, a few people say that the really big budget films are not going to be, they're not going to really happen in the next 12 months. And this might leave an opportunity for some smaller or mid-sized budget films to take place. Well, I don't know. I mean, listen, yeah, in theory, I just don't think it works like that. I think if you're talking about those superhero movies, that's a specific market. The people who go and see superhero movies don't necessarily want to go and see a low budget brilliant peter strickland film or something you know they're very very different worlds and the you know i mean the superhero movies those or the, the big marquee movies are oh, 250 million upwards vast amounts of money very very commercial i don't and, and i don't think the studios are going to be taking that money and kind of going oh we can't make our superhero movies we were going to make one $250 million movie, but instead we'll make 25, $10 million movies. I wish they would do that. I mean, I guess if those films aren't on the screen soaking up viewers, then maybe it means there's more room for other things to break out. Because another point of view is that the, the, there will be a very strong consolidation. We will see uh, with the studio system, the vertical integration of right. Uh, right. studios, cinemas, uh, but now through the streaming industry it can be quite scary. Yeah, no, no, no. Listen, it is a, it's a very scary world. There is a lot of opportunities out there, but it's changing. There's more stuff being made though, I think now, because of the proliferation of, of channels. I mean, yes, maybe there'll be some horrible dystopian future. We certainly seem to be living in a dystopian future at the moment. I feel like I'm living in the Omega Man or something like that. <laughs> One of the great moments in American cultural history is when you have the studio system. You know, there are amazing things made during the studio system. So even if it does come together as some, you know, so, some kind of vertically integrated, nightmarish, monopolistic, I think that will hold for a while and then something will come which will break it up again. The thing is as well, though, there's a lot more streaming maybe than in, um, in, in the cinema. There's a lot of speciality interests and you can, you can find your audience now. We're not just lurching from one phase in the Industrial Revolution to another that actually what we're going through at the moment, and the pandemic is part of it, is a change that is as big as the change when we were going from agriculture to industri an industrialized society. You know, as we finally go from industrialized into let's say a post-industrialized digitally based society. The great thing is that the point of entry now is much cheaper than it used to be. Because, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have computers, you know, you, you couldn't go out and, I mean, I can go out and shoot something on this, you know, wander down. Now, maybe low budget, maybe not the world's best production values, but I can shoot it, I can distribute it, you know, with, there's, it's an interesting time. Because we also have the other end of all of this, which is the audience. How will they react to, to everything? You've got a month more quarantine, we'll say, yeah? Okay, the quarantine ends. Are you telling me the next day you will go to the cinema? No. Right. There we go. So we are the audience as well, you know. So I don't know that I'm going to rush in to, to, to do it, but probably the amount of, I mean, I do different kinds of viewing. I've got a TV here. I've also got a projector. Um, I, but I was, watch stuff on my computer and sometimes I even watch stuff on my phone. You know, it depends what it is, you know. If it's David Lynch, I don't watch it on the phone because he'll tell me off. <laughs> and has, has the pandemic affected your livelihood? No, I was not about to go into production, but I had some things that were looking likely towards the middle or the end of the year, but of course that's just been pushed off and then you have to fight with actor availability. No one knows because other productions have been postponed. I was gonna be doing um, some workshops in the Middle East. They were all postponed or maybe canceled completely. So every single bit of work, all that I was gonna be at the, I was head of the jury, international jury at the Safira International Film Festival. 
um, in Bulgaria, that was canceled. So my whole diary, like, whoom, was just completely, it disappeared. Obviously productions are very, you know, uh, international these days. Do you think that in the next 12 months that's going to be harder because people will not travel? And... Everything's going to be harder for the next 12 months. Everything. I guess there is a world in which local production starts up using local crew and local talent. Maybe, maybe the world becomes more regionalized, but a lot of the time that us as filmmakers, we end up working in other places, is it's an economic thing. If I go and shoot in Romania, partly it's to do amazing Romanian crew, amazing locations, blah, 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 but also it's because if I shoot in France, it costs me, I don't know what, 30%, 60% more, but it will mean that those films won't get made, you know? So that's what- You don't, you don't think that they will, you know, they will be, for example, Imagine that you'd have a film that was going to shoot in, in Romania. Yeah. And even with the Romanian crew, probably you'd think twice before going because you go to a country which is, well, not necessarily your own. Safer. We'd go to a country that's safer because they've got their dealing with, with, uh, with COVID a lot better over there than we are in the UK. And they've got a much smaller death count. So I won't hear you say there are no implications against the Romanians. Thank you very much. It's, listen, I just think the thing is, it depends on the kind of film you're talking about because there are some films that you've got enough money to shoot it if you can shoot it in Romania, but it's gonna cost you 30% more if you shoot it in France or you shoot it in the UK. Now that, people won't necessarily pay 30% more, you know, they just won't make it. Peter, uh, anything else you'd like to add? No, 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 that's good. It's really a great pleasure seeing you again. I, I was hoping to see you in Espinu, um, but it will have to wait for later in the year or next year, okay? Yeah, exactly. All right, take care.